Hello and welcome to Optimus Island, a look on the bright side. I'm Neil Wood, and I'm here to introduce you to all the positive stories of the world. My talk will always focus on something positive, inspiring, encouraging, and of course, optimistic. Why? Because the so-called news shows that around 24-7 and, and worldwide are filled with horrible news every day and of people acting poorly and other various tragedies. Those stories are emotionally draining and they're filled with gloom and doom. They make the world look like a very grim place. Instead, I want to give viewers something to feel good about, to gain hope instead of despair, to look on the bright side and learn how to be aware of the best moments in their day, their week, and their life. The method to be more aware of the positive events is a strategy I've shared with more than 50,000 people over the last 20 years. And I just want to bring you back to a moment when my son was just six years old. Now, he's 24 now. He was waking up in a terrible mood every morning. And I thought, what on earth? I know that happens in the teen years, but what on earth could be wrong when he's six years old? We were loving parents, very encouraging, lived in a beautiful neighborhood, and all the good stuff. So I asked him one night, I said, Nikki, what was the, what, how was your day, for example? And he said, oh my God, Dad, I've had the worst day of my life. I had a fight with my best friend. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, they've been friends for about five days. So he said, I had a fight with my best friend. I fell down in the drive when I, I scratched my knee and I broke my favorite toy. And he went on and on for about a minute. And it suddenly hit me that what he was doing before bedtime was almost like us watching the evening news. It's filled with gloom and doom, right? So Nick would think before bedtime of all the bad things that happened. Now, folks, I listened to him, and I felt badly. But then I got this aha moment, and I realized that I had to change the tape, the mental tape in his head. So I asked a very simple question. And folks, this is a script, but it's a really powerful script. I asked, well, Nikki, I'm sorry all that happened. What was the best part of your day and your brain is really awesome your brain will act like a filter and a funnel so all of a sudden when you change that script and when I asked him what was the best part of his day he just broke into the most beautiful smile I had seen in years he said oh my gosh dad we went to the zoo today and I saw this great big lion roar and I saw a giraffe that was so tall and then this huge rhinoceros this, this big thing coming out of his nose Nick went on and on and on for 10 minutes about the best part of his day. So I realized that we had to do that more often. So every single night from that point on, we would ask him about the best part of his day. And then it didn't take long before his four-year-old brother started asking the same question. Hey, what about the best part of my day? So when we said it was bedtime, they raced upstairs. So I hope you get the point of that. Before you go to bed at night, if you watch the evening news, it's going to weigh heavily on your mind. Instead, try this. Think about the best part of your day. Now, I share that with you as a parent, but I also share that with you as a business owner because we can dwell on whatever we want to focus on. Right? There, there are a lot of things in life that we can't control, like the weather, the economy, uh, how people are going to treat you, but our thoughts and what we say really are within our control. So I want you to try this after this first show you get to watch. Before bed tonight, think about and even write down the three best parts of your day. Now, granted, I know some people are going to say, oh my gosh, Neil, it's so Pollyanna. There are a lot of bad things happening. Folks, there are both good and bad things happening every day. It depends what you want to focus on. And I'll share this with you. And, you, and if you think about it, you'll understand. If you only dwell on the negatives, it'll drag you down and it'll zap you of energy. But if you focus on the good things, the nice people you met, the positive uh, situations that happened during the day, maybe you found something shopping that you didn't expect to find, or somebody let you cut into traffic while so many other people were trying to race by, there are little things in life that can make a huge difference in your energy, in your happiness, and your attitude. So today's segment is really on how to be a little bit happier. And a lot of that ties into your thoughts your positive self-talk, or your negative self-talk. I, I want you to think about this for a moment. If you talk to yourself like someone you loved, or as if you loved yourself, what things would you say to yourself every day? Right? I've run into so many people in all the seminars I've hosted on happiness 
and attitude and success and goal setting. And so many people say, oh, Neil, I can't. You know, I, I had such a tough time growing up, and this happened and that happened, and they're stuck in the past. And so I want to share a story with you because the past does not predict the future. I grew up on welfare, and at 13, I started reading books on positive thinking and how to make changes in my life. And that was one of the first aha moments in my life because I read about people who had it so much worse than I did. And yet, over the years, they put the past behind them and they built up this fantastic career of success. And a lot of it had to do with attitude. And a lot of it had to do with what I talked about earlier, positive self-talk. And a lot of it had to do with taking action, not dwelling in the past, not making that an excuse and suffering from what we call excusitis, but actually taking charge of your life and saying, the rest of my life is in my hands. What can I do to make changes? What are my goals? So I, we talk about goals, and we're going to talk about this a little bit la later when Dan Snyder joins us. 10% of the population actually have goals written on paper. So when I learned that when I was 13 years old, I wrote some goals down. And all, slowly things started to happen. And at 16 years old, I had another aha moment. I realized I had to leave home. So I left home, went on my own, and never looked back. The things that happened in your past can be used as stepping stones. You don't have to just dwell on it and let it suck you down. Use it as a stepping stone. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? You know, you can use it as an anchor and make excuses. Or you can use it as a stepping stone and say, okay, where do I want to go now? What's my plan? How much can I do with my life over the next 20 years or 40 years or even the next five? So just something to think about as you ponder after the show is over and you're driving down the road. So there are so many opportunities in this great country we live in. Don't get stuck in the past. Look ahead to where you want to fly to. Welcome back. We are joined by my friend Dan Snyder of Hingham Community Access and Media. Neil, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be on the show, and I'm anxious to hear your side of the story. And I wanted to come on to ask you a few questions sure. um, about your life experiences and how you can relate those to others. And mm -hmm. So let's just dive right into it. Uh, what makes you th uh, so enthusiastic and optimistic in life? Dan, I have to think it's a great example of the people working here at the, at the cable. Uh, show it. People love what they do. And that's what keeps me so enthusiastic. I'm working on a number of projects right now that uh, keep me excited every day. I, I, you know, it, some people ask, oh, wait a minute, are you really optimistic and enthusiastic? But for the people who've known me for 20 years or 25 years or more, they know I've been this way since I was in high school. So I'm doing what I love. And it's one of the things I encourage people to do. You know, don't just take a job. Find something that you can really pour your heart into and know that you're touching lives in a positive way, and that will keep people enthusiastic and optimistic like I am. Sure. So do you have a, a personal experience where you may have been in a situation where you weren't exactly happy and you, forego, you, you forewent that uh, position and mm -hmm. you found yourself into a better position that suited yeah. your mental needs? If, yeah. If well. yeah I'll, I'll take you back all the way 43 years ago. I was, I was just 16 years old. I was living in a very negative environment. And I realized then that I had to make some changes. So I, I hate to admit this, but I left home. And I, within a few months, was adopted by a local family that I, I went to school with the kids. Uh, and I went from a home where I was told I was a loser, I'd never be anything in life, to a home that was surrounded with love. And they encouraged me. They said, Neil, you can do anything you put your heart into. Be good to people keep your promises, and know what you want to do in life. You know, have your goals. So it was just such an aha moment for me. And there are many points in life, Dan, where I think we hit a crossroads. And if we take the right road, it just gives us a trajectory onto a whole new, whole new route. So I really lucked out at 16. And that just set the format going forward. I, uh, I went to college for one year. Had no idea what I wanted to do. Like most kids who are 18 or 19 years old. And I remember the uh, director of admissions coming up, J.J. Cunningham. He said, Woody, they called me Woody at the time, we love you around here. Everybody knows you. You're on a lot of committees. But unfortunately, your grades are not good after the first year. So why don't you take some time off and 
get away and just kind of grow up a little bit, which was great advice. He, he said it with kindness in his heart. He wasn't picking on me. And so I joined the Air Force. Got stationed in northern Italy for four years. Another one of those trajectories that just changed my life. While I was there, I met a fighter pilot uh, who was retired now, and he was teaching college courses on the base at this base in Italy. And we became great friends, and uh, we had a good talk. And when it was time for me to leave and come back to the United States, and again, this is another aha moment, I said, uh, Tom, thank you for your friendship. You've been a mentor to me. You've been so good in my life. And uh, I'm excited about going back to the States. And he said, Neil, when you go back to the States, you're going to be wildly successful. I said, well, Tom, thanks. But something I never told you is I grew up on welfare. I ran away from home at 16. My parents dropped out of school in seventh grade. So I haven't had the best framework, you know, the, the foundation to really excel. And he said, here's something I learned, Neil. He said, I was on a bombing mission in Vietnam. My jet was attacked by a missile. Fortunately, I ejected through the canopy. But when I landed, I hit the ground so hard I fractured bones in my legs, and I was temporarily blind. I was put in a prison camp for five long years. He said, here's what I learned when I get out. We all have stuff in our past. You know what you have to leave it? In your past. He said, the rest of your life is in your hands. You're responsible for where you go from here. He said, you're not a kid anymore. You're 23 years old, 24 years old. He said, the past does not predict the future. What do you want to do? What are your goals? He said, if you help enough people reach their goals, you'll accomplish everything you put your mind to. Dan, that was another one of those aha moments. While I was there with him, he also turned me on to goal setting. And uh, with that, I, I started jogging. Uh, I was a little bit overweight. Within six months, I dropped 30, 30 pounds. I started winning races in Italy. And that propelled me to compete in Greece, in Spain, in Italy, among other Air Force runners. I came back to the States, and, and in 1983, I met a coach who volunteered to help me train to make the Olympic trials. Wow. So all these little things happened. I met these people at different points in my life that just set me off on a whole different trajectory. But it all ties back to what the theme of the show is. I was doing what made me happy whether it was running or, or being in the Air Force or traveling or doing whatever, I did things that made me happy. It was congruent with my goals and my purpose in life. I'm, I'm glad you introduced uh, goal setting here because uh, clearly that's something that keeps people on track for yes. a positive and happy mentality. Um, obviously, you grew up in a troubled past. What were some of your goals, um, whether it be to, to improve your life on a, on a financial way mm -hmm. or in a mentally... Uh, more stable way, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, what were some of your goals as you were growing up as a child? Dan, that's a great question. I had goals as a teenager that when I grew up, I would not be on welfare. I would be actually wealthy and very successful. But that wasn't even the most important part. I vowed that I'd be a fantastic parent because I didn't have great role model growing up. Uh, my father was awesome, but he was in the Navy, so I only saw him once or twice a year briefly. Um, but I vowed that when I became an adult, I'd be a very good father, a very loving father, and, uh, and a leader in the community. Somebody who could reach out and touch lives and make a positive difference in people's lives like people did with mine. So, but you also asked a good question about goal setting. While I learned that when I was 19 years old or 20, 10% of the population have goals that are written down on paper. Most people, unfortunately, are really a wandering generality. It's almost like a, a ship without a rudder. You know where it goes? Wherever the current brings it. Right? But when you have goals and you look at them every day, because you've written them down, you put them by the mirror in the bathroom, and you look at them in the morning, and you look at them in the night before bedtime, somehow that just kind of attracts things in the world, in the universe, to bring you to those goals getting accomplished. Sure. So that could be one way that quote unquote, prevent people from reaching those goals. Yes. Uh, what are some other factors that you think uh, play into not being able to achieve your goals? Stinking thinking, right? We think about people and some of the things they say to themselves. And I've done a lot of seminars on how to be more enthusiastic or how to love life or how to be happier or how to reach your goals. And so many people fill their day knocking themselves down. So I encourage people to instead talk to yourself like you actually love yourself. What would you say to yourself? Right? 
So many people say, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I'm too this, I'm too that, and they just, again, knock themselves down. I say, wait a minute, why don't you do a checkup from the neck up? What do you like about yourself? Right? Are you good to people? Are you honest? Do you have integrity? Are you making a difference in people's lives every day? What do you like about yourself? I encourage people, write it down in a notebook and just keep writing until you're done. Most people can come up with about 40 things they like about themselves, maybe more, instead of putting themselves down. Because if they look on the bright side and look at the, what they like about themselves, they will be more enthusiastic and more positive. There's another part to it, of course. You gotta hang around with people who actually encourage you, as opposed to people who kind of bring you down. And you know, when we think about being here in the studio, everybody I've met has been really positive about what they're doing, because you know you're making a difference, right? In a very positive way. Sure. So, uh, I understand you have a, a daily reminder email that you send out yes. uh, at your place of business, and I've been fortunate enough to be added to that mailing list, so I wake up every morning with a motivational message mm -hmm. or an optimistic, an optimistic uh, message to, to get me through the day. What, uh, what, what influenced you to start, that, to start that process? Yes, I started that process in 2008 after the crisis collapsed the stock market, and so many people lost their jobs or lost trillions of dollars in the market. And I knew people needed help because I, I ran into a lot of people I had known for many years and they were so down. I mean, the world was upside down. It was the worst economy we had since the 1929 stock market crash. People lost so much. So I realized I had to be a bright light. And I started this Optimus Island email that goes out every morning to thousands of people. And the feedback I receive is wonderful. Neil, you read my thoughts. This is just what I needed right now. And I don't, I don't get anything for it financially. I didn't want anything. It was, again, my way of giving back. But you're right. Every morning, it's something inspirational. I, th I think one of the biggest ways, one of the best ways to become more positive is in the morning, read something positive. Read something enthusiastic. Uh, same thing before bed at night. Think about some of the good things that happen, right? And, and even read something from an inspirational book that makes you feel good before bedtime. So uh, I also uh, was happy to find out that you're an author also. Um, not only do you give motivational speeches and, and public speeches, but you're also an author of a couple uh, number one best-selling books. Talk to me uh, a little bit about those um, mm -hmm. and, and what persuaded you to, to want to be an author. Sure. I was a sales rep for many years, and part of, of what I did to separate myself from my competition is I work with financial advisors on how to run a better business, how to strengthen relationships with your clients, how to get referrals, and really how to have more fun in life. Because in my opinion, you gotta have that balance of life. The old way of thinking in the 80s was to work 80 hours a week. Just work yourself to death. And at the end of the day, you, you know, people dying at 60 years old, like, what was this for? So I wrote the book for financial advisors and even other salespeople to teach them about how to work smarter and how to have that balance in life. The feedback has been tremendous. So that's one of the books. The other book I wrote in 2014 was to help people in the second chapter of their life. So many people got divorced in their 30s, 40s, 50s, or 60s, and all of a sudden, they're on the dating scene again for the first time in 20 or 30 or 40 years. The world has changed. So since I was not a guy to go to bars and pick people up, that was never my thing, sure. uh, I thought, how can I meet women that I have a lot in common with. So I tried the online dating and it was really a fantastic way to meet people I had a lot in common with. So I had such a great success with it that I wrote a book on the positives and some of the things to watch out for to help both men and women find love again. Sure. So let's, let's tie that into today's theme a little bit sure. of, of how to be happier oh. and, and how to and how to portray a happier lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, what are some key points in, in either one of your books, whether it be financially or, yes. or emotionally? What, how, can you, how can you tie into being a happier person mm -hmm. through those specific avenues? Sure. Uh, again, a great question. You think of anybody who is a financial advisor or in sales, you want to surround yourself with people you actually enjoy doing business with. Sure. Imagine if the only people you attracted were really grumpy, miserable, nasty people who are going to call you every day and curse you, oh, the stock market's down, blah, blah, blah. it just drags you down. What I encourage advisors to do is give those to other people. Give those to the grumpy advisors. Find people you actually enjoy being with. Because if you do this right, they become your friends when they see how much you care about them. 
with the dating book, the online dating, dating success after 40, I encourage people to sit for a moment and think about your next mate, your next match. Who are you looking for? What's their attitude? What are their activities? And with online dating now, once people create a profile, you see all of those things. I want to be around somebody who is positive and outgoing and upbeat, um, who like to exercise like I did. I like yoga and running and beach walking and all those things. All of that is online dating, is in their profile. So, I, you know, a few years later, I found my match. Ended up getting married this May. So it takes a little time, but to me, it's much better than going to a bar or finding somebody at a football game saying, hey, we might have something in common. Hey, you may not. <laughs> with the online dating, it speeds the process up. And again, just like with the financial advisors or salespeople, you're going out with people you have a lot in common with. Sure. So it leads to a happier life. Sure, of course. Um, right? Going back to goal setting a little bit as yes. well, because uh, that definitely will lead to, as you accomplish more goals, you become happier and you yes. feel accomplished. What yes. are some, uh, some personal goals that you might have uh, going further into your, into your career? I want to continue doing shows like this. This is, in my opinion, a great medium to touch thousands of lives. Uh, one of my favorite speakers was Zig Ziglar. And I remember one of his quotes. We're going to be dead a lot longer than we're alive. We're not here for a long time. And I believe, as good people, we have a responsibility to touch lives in a positive way while we're here, to give people encouragement, to, to give them uh, inspiration, and to make them feel better about themselves, or at least teach them how to feel better about themselves. So that's one of my goals. Uh, I have more books to write. My daughter, I have a 16-year-old daughter, has asked me not to write any more business books or dating books, she said, write a book about attitude and overcoming obstacles and how to find happiness within. Because if you can find it within, you can find it outside. So I promised her that that would be my next book. It's about how to live a happier life. Excellent. Um, go, go, a little bit, and, uh, excuse me, go a little more into uh, in the message that you portray to people through, through your uh, motivational speeches and your public speaking. Because I understand you have a, a long career of of traveling yes. and a lot of miles logged of, of giving speeches to everybody in the country. So go talk, talk a little more about, about that. Yeah, thank you. There are a few years where I spoke at over 250 events a year. So I was living on airplanes and in hotels, yet I was doing something I loved. And what I always encourage people to do, as we talked a little bit about earlier, find something where your heart is. Where you, what are you passionate about? I want people to be able to jump out of bed in the morning and say, I'm psyched, I'm going to work. Not, oh my God, another day. I can retire in 25 years. It's just too long, right? So I, I encourage them, find something that you're passionate about where you want to jump out of bed and make a difference and really be enthusiastic. So uh, the other thing I've done with the motivational speaking is I've used stories of other people who came from nothing or overcame adversity, whatever it was, we think of a guy like Tony Robbins, who is wildly successful, multi, multi-millionaire, ran, ran away from home at 16. Mm -hmm. And yet he said, you know what? I'm going to make changes in my life. And people like Tony and me are grateful for what we had to overcome as a teenager because I believe that if I grew up with a silver spoon in my mouth, I wouldn't be here today. I'd just be living a cushy life on some yacht, you know? But my background was, as you know, completely opposite of that. That inspires people, I believe, to just say, I'm going to make changes. So I've talked about that all over the country to nearly 50,000 people, about leaving the past where it belongs, finding what makes you happy, and pursuing it. Sure. Uh, so obviously you've had difficulties in your past that, mm -hmm. that you've been able to overcome to, to maintain this positive and upbeat lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and there could be some skeptics out there who say, there's no way he can maintain this this attitude what are uh what are some ways that you that you pep yourself up and maybe some difficulties that you've had to overcome with just within the last few years that 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 help you keep that upbeat and positive lifestyle going mm -hmm. well uh, i read something inspirational every morning and and the same thing at night so when i'm getting the quotes ready for the following morning i read probably 20 minutes of inspirational quotes to find the one that i really like that's going to work the following morning. So imagine going to bed after reading 20 minutes of inspiration and, and, uh, and happiness and encouragement. I'd feel pretty good. But you did hit something on the head. I've had many people say, you can't be that enthusiastic. Sure. That, that you've got to be a fraud. 
And again, the people who've known me for most of my life, since I was a, just a teenager, know that it's real and it's sincere. And uh, as far as obstacles to overcome, the 2008 collapse of the stock market was tough. My life went upside down. And I remember sitting in a, in a chair looking over at the Sunset Bay in, in Hull and I just said, I'm going to turn this around. Now, other people have been through financial crises. I'm going to turn this around. And I slowly started building my way back up because other people have done it, right? Of course. Some of the richest people in history went bankrupt three or four times. I didn't go bankrupt, but, but uh, I certainly hit some lean times. And uh, it's okay to get knocked down, but you don't lose unless you stay down. It's important to get back up. You think of a boxer, right? Mm -hmm. Get knocked down nine times, get up every time, and then you're still in the fight. Because I, I do believe that um, if we don't win, we learn a lesson, and it just makes us stronger for the next time. Sure. The first time I ran a marathon, it was in Athens, Greece, when I was in the Air Force, and I ran three hours and 16 minutes because I went out way too fast. Ah, lesson learned. I said, I'll never go out that fast again in a marathon. You had to pace yourself, and a lot of it ties into life, right? Especially the marathon training. You've got to have goals. You've got to pace yourself. You've got to persevere. You have to have discipline to get the work done, and that long-term goal that you look at every day. Um, Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense, and it's it's a good uh, it's a good attitude to live by if you want to maintain a positive lifestyle. Um, you talked about the quotes a little bit. Do you have uh, specific events that occur during the day that lead you to use a specific quote, or is it whatever strikes your eye at the end of the day? Both. Um, sometimes, you know. So, for example, we think of New England drivers, right? And you see this long line of traffic, and all of a sudden somebody stops to let you take that left turn. You're like, wow, thanks a lot. So I might share a quote on kindness or, or uh, doing something for somebody else that, that nobody would expect or, or coincidences in life. I don't know if there really are coincidences. I believe things happen for a reason. There was an author in Quincy who wrote a book, God Winked. And that's what he refers to as coincidences. There's a reason for everything that happens. Great. Well, Neil, I want to I wanna thank you for allowing me to take the time to to ask you a few questions about your, about your past and about how you maintain such a positive and upbeat and happy lifestyle. And when we come back, I, we're going to wrap up the show and we're going to summarize uh, how to be happier. Okay. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. All right. My pleasure. Hi, and welcome back to Optimus Island. So just to wrap up this series, let's talk about what we really covered today. Number one is positive self-talk. What do you say to yourself every day? There are thousands of thoughts that run through our brain. Actually, there are 60,000 thoughts that run through our brain every single day. Do your best to make most of those positive, encouraging, inspiring, as opposed to knocking yourself down. If you make a mistake somewhere along the way during the day, shrug it off. You know what? We all make mistakes. It's part of life. So if you get knocked down, the key is to get back up and just persevere and just keep going. Another key to being happier in life is to surround yourself with people who are encouraging, who are inspiring, who believe in you, who make you feel good about yourself. So many times we get dragged down with these conversations of blah, 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 this is wrong, that's wrong. Just stay away from the naysayers. Uh, they don't really add anything to your life that's positive. And uh, if they're constantly in your life, just make excuses. Oh, I'd love to talk long, but I have to go get a root canal. Got to run. Take care. So we talked earlier in the show about doing a checkup from the neck up. Get out a piece of paper or a notepad and jot down all the things you actually like about yourself. Now, some people along the way have asked me, Neil, can you really be that enthusiastic? The bottom line is absolutely. I'm doing what I love. I'm surrounded by people I really enjoy in life. I have goals that I look at every single morning and every single day and, and night that encourage me and somehow just brings into the universe some way to make things happen. So your happiness and your attitude about both in your hands every single day. We can't control the weather. We can't control the economy. We can't control politics. But you are in control of your attitude, your self-talk, and who you surround yourself with every day. Wishing you all the best. Until the next show. Keep smiling and remain optimistic.